OK, bonjour tout le monde. On va commencer tranquillement. Euh, donc, je suis heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui le professeur Jesse Bloom, qui est professeur au Predage Center, Cancer Center à Seattle et qui est aussi un chercheur associé au uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, Jesse a fait son, sa, un, une formation uh, au départ, en, a reçu une formation au départ en biochimie. Il a fait son, son bac en biochimie à l'Université de Chicago. Et ensuite, il a fait ses études de, doctorales à Caltech, en Californie. Et puis, sa superviseur était Francis Arnold, uh, qu'on connaît tous pour, uh, pour ses travaux en uh, qui utilise l'évolution euh, dirigée pour, euh, pour l'amélioration d'enzymes et pour, laquelle, euh, pour lesquelles elle a gagné un prix Nobel euh, récemment. Puis ensuite, Jesse a fait son, son post-doc euh, aussi à Caltech avec euh, David euh, Baltimore. Euh, depuis presque 15 ans maintenant, donc depuis 2011, euh, Jesse est, est euh, professeur à, à Seattle, euh, au Fred Dutch, et euh, il a fait beaucoup de travaux sur l'évolution euh, des protéines au départ, puis ensuite, il s'est intéressé, il a commencé à faire des travaux sur l'évolution des virus, et donc il est devenu, euh, par le biais de ses travaux, il est devenu euh, vi virologiste. Il a gagné plusieurs prix au cours de sa carrière pour, euh, pour ses travaux. Euh, déjà en 2012, il a gagné euh, euh, des, des prix euh, pour, euh, qui, non, qui, qui récompensaient ou qui soulignaient le travail des chercheurs, euh, des jeunes chercheurs les, les plus exceptionnels aux États-Unis, il a gagné des prix pour, euh, comme uh, Young Investigator in, in Virology, il a gagné des prix de l'American Society for Microbiology pour, pour ses travaux, et il a aussi gagné des prix euh, au Fred Hutch pour euh, son encadrement d'étudiants et de stagiaires postdoctoraux. Euh, donc, il fait à la fois une recherche euh, impressionnante, mais aussi il contribue à former des jeunes, des jeunes chercheurs. Um, Jesse a fait uh, depuis quelques années, c'est de ça dont ils vont nous parler aujourd'hui, il nous parle de, il travaille sur le SARS-CoV-2 uh, et uh, un de ses papiers les plus cités dans, dans sa carrière, qui a été cité plus de mille fois, est un papier qui a été publié en 2020 uh, sur l'évolution de, de protéines du virus. Donc, il uh, faut imaginer comme le, la pandémie a commencé en, en 2020, uh, en tout cas en Amérique du Nord, uh, ses travaux se sont déroulés uh, super, uh, super rapidement. Puis de façon intéressante, moi, je connaissais les travaux de Jesse avant qu'il travaille sur ce, ce sujet-là, parce qu'au doctorat, il a travaillé sur l'évolution des protéines. Et d'ailleurs, son deuxième papier le plus cité euh, porte sur euh, l'évolution des protéines, puis comment la stabilité des protéines promouvoit euh, leur euh, évolvabilité ou leur capacité euh, à évoluer. Et euh, donc, c'est à, à partir de ces travaux-là que j'ai connu la, la carrière de, de Jesse. Et euh, si vous êtes intéressé euh, au cours des dernières années à euh, l'histoire de, de l'apparition du, 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 de SARS-CoV-2 en, en Chine, entre autres, vous avez peut-être vu des articles de, de Jesse dans des euh, journaux comme euh, le New York Times où il écrit certains articles pour euh, euh, amener les gens à porter attention à, à certaines questions euh, concernant l'origine de, de ce, ce virus de, de la pandémie. Donc, j'ai invité euh, avec, euh, avec Sophie Gobet, on a pensé inviter Jesse euh, cette année pour un séminaire. Euh, il a gentiment accepté. Il ne pouvait pas se déplacer, mais il nous a offert de faire le séminaire en ligne. Donc, on est super content de, de l'avoir avec nous. So, thank you for uh, being here, Jesse, and uh, the floor is yours. OK, so thank you for... I don't, I don't speak French, so I hope it was a kind introduction. I hope you didn't say too many bad things about me. Uh, anyway, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but I, I hope that you can at least get something out of this remote presentation. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the evolution of SARS-CoV-2, and the link to the slides I'm presenting uh, is, is right here. So I want to start with some background. So this is a study uh, that was performed uh, well over uh, you know, 150 years ago, almost 200 years ago now, called Observations Made During the Epidemic of Measles on the Faroe Islands in the year 1846. And this study was done by the Danish physician, Peter Ludwig Panna. So the Faroe Islands are located here in the North Atlantic, sort of off the coast of Scotland. Uh, they're part of Denmark. 
And particularly back in uh, 1846, there was not a lot of traffic from mainland Europe to the Faroe Islands. And so the reason that this Danish physician, Peter Ludwig Panem, went to the Faroe Islands in 1846 is as he describes in his study, there hadn't been any measles on the Faroe Islands since 1781. And then there was this measles outbreak that started in April 1846 when measles came on a boat over from mainland Europe. And so what Peter Panem did is he went around the island and he looked to see what happened during this outbreak. And he found that of the 7,782 people living on the island, about 6,000 of them came down with measles. But the really important thing he noted, which made this sort of a classic study in epidemiology, was that of the many older people uh, still living on the Faroe Islands in 1846, who had measles 65 years previously in 1781, not a single one of them came down with measles the second time. And so what we now know that Peter Panem was describing here is this phenomenon of immune memory, which provides lifelong protection from measles. So in the old days, uh, you were infected with measles once in your lifetime and then you never got it again. And today, if you get the measles vaccine, you're basically guaranteed to be protected against measles for the rest of your life. However, we don't have lifelong protection against all human respiratory viruses. So for instance, the typical person is infected by influenza virus about every five years. So why is that? So broadly speaking, you can sort of think of two classes of hypotheses. One is what I would call sort of the immunological hypothesis, which is that just somehow the antibody response or the immune response we make to influenza virus is not as good as the one we make to measles. So that immunity just doesn't last as long. And the second possible explanation is that it has to do with the virus, that maybe the flu virus is changing in a way that the measles virus isn't to get away from this immunity. You know, and importantly, these are not mutually exclusive explanations. And we can get some sense of the answer to this by looking at the natural history of influenza virus. So influenza viruses have been infecting humans for many, many centuries. But the first influenza virus we know about in molecular detail was this so-called 1918 influenza that's thought to have jumped into humans, possibly from a bird in 1918, and then caused this global pandemic. But importantly, after 1918, that H1N1 influenza did not disappear. It kept circulating in humans, evolving a little bit year to year, and infecting people every few years. That happened up until 1957. Then there were some genes from a different strain of influenza that jumped into humans, caused another global pandemic. That virus then circulated in humans, evolving a little bit year to year and reinfecting people every few years up until 1968. And then we had another pandemic, the H3N2 pandemic, and that virus is still circulating in humans, still evolving a little bit year to year and still infecting people about every five years. So when you look at all of this history here, you cannot tell whether people are being reinfected with influenza because their immunity is not very good or because the virus is changing. But in 1977, there was another uh, influenza pandemic, the so-called uh, 1977 H1N1 Russian flu. And this pandemic was caused by reappearance of a virus that was genetically identical to the H1N1 viruses that had existed in about 1953. Uh, so this virus had been evolutionarily frozen, and it's actually thought that the virus had just been literally frozen in a freezer until it was inadvertently re-released in 1977. And so now when we look at this 1977 pandemic, it's different than all of the other pandemics because time has elapsed, but the virus hasn't changed at all. So people older than about 24 years old would have been exposed to this exact same virus in the past. So what happened in 1977? Here's an article from March 4th, 1978 from the British Medical Journal called Influenza in a Boarding School. So they describe how there was one boy from Hong Kong who came back with a fever in mid-January 
within a few days, a few other boys in the in the on the boarding school had gotten sick. And overall, 67% of the boys in this boarding school got sick enough with this virus that they had to spend between three and seven days away from class. However, of the about 130 adults at the school who had contact with the boys, only one of them developed similar symptoms. So I know this is sort of an anecdotal study, but it, it's describing what was observed throughout this pandemic. There was a very high attack rate in people younger than about 25 years old and a very low attack rate in adults. And the reason for that is that these adults still had good immunity from 25 years before when they'd been exposed to the exact same virus. And so I think this example is showing us that influenza infection actually also elicits robust multi-decade immunity. Maybe it's not quite as good as that against measles, but it's still pretty good. It's protecting these people 25 years later. But importantly, that immunity only really works that way if the virus is evolutionarily frozen. And normally flu virus is not evolutionarily frozen. It's changing year to year. And that's why in fact, the typical person is normally reinfected about every five years with the new evolutionary descendants of the current virus. So I like to think of human RNA respiratory viruses is sort of existing on this spectrum. There are some such as measles which evolved so slowly to escape antibodies that on the lifespan of a human, there's essentially no antigenic change. And there's others like influenza viruses that evolve so rapidly that we're reinfected again and again and again during our lifetimes. And why these viruses fall on different parts of the spectrum is sort of a a deep and largely unsolved question that I'm not gonna really get into in this talk. But one of the things that I really wanna emphasize is that it's more than just mutation rate. So all RNA viruses, including both measles and influenza have high mutation rates. So they make a lot of errors when they're copying their genomes. But only for influenza virus does this high mutation rate lead to a high rate of actual antigenic evolution to escape from antibodies. And the fundamental difference is that, you know, evolution is not the same as mutation. Evolution depends on mutation to introduce genetic variation. But after those mutations occur, evolution also depends on what the impact of those mutations are and how selection acts on them. Okay, so now I want to go to another study, uh, this or another article. This was an article that was published in the Washington Post uh, in March of 2020, entitled, the coronavirus isn't mutating quickly, suggesting a vaccine would offer lasting protection. And the argument that was sort of used to advance this viewpoint was the observation that coronaviruses have a somewhat lower mutation rate than influenza viruses or measles viruses because they have some proofreading activity in their polymerase. Uh, and so this article was incorrectly conflating the fact that the mutation rate was lower to think that the rate of actual evolution would be lower. But as I just discussed, you know, those of us who are evolutionary biologists should understand that mutation rate and rate of adaptive evolution are not necessarily the same thing. And so in that sense, maybe the argument in this, in this article is not that strong. And indeed, uh, one of the things that we were interested in looking at at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was how do other human coronaviruses evolve? So SARS-CoV-2 is not the first coronavirus to infect humans. There are four so-called common cold coronaviruses that infect humans and typically cause mostly mild respiratory sy symptoms. And one of those is a virus called coronavirus 229E that's been circulating in humans for a long time. And the typical person is infected with coronavirus 229E about every three to five years, which should already make you a little bit suspicious that coronavirus immunity might not be like measles virus immunity. So what we did is we went to GenBank and we downloaded the spike sequences for all of the coronavirus 229Es that were available at that time. And then we just built this phylogenetic tree shown here. So the older sequences from the early 1980s are here on the left, and the newer sequences from the last few years are here on the right. 
And one thing I hope you can appreciate is this tree has what's called a ladder-like shape. There's one major trunk lineage that I'm tracing along right here, and then lots of little short branches that come off that trunk but then die out. And so this evolutionary pattern is something I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, but it's basically characteristic of a virus that's changing rapidly over time, but has low standing genetic diversity at any given time. And so when a virus evolves in this way, just knowing where you are on the x-axis, so where you are in time, is a pretty good indication of where you are in the evolutionary space. So what we did is we took spikes at eight year intervals across this tree, the one shown here in black, and we used them to generate spike pseudotyped lentiviral particles that we could study in the lab. And we then did a really simple experiment. We took an old human serum sample. So this was serum that was collected from a human individual in 1985. And we asked how well could the antibodies in that person's serum neutralize infection by viruses with the spike from 1984, 1992, 2001, and so on. And so the x-axis is when the spike was isolated, or that, when that virus existed, and the y-axis is how well the antibodies block infection, with a bigger number meaning they're better at blocking infection. So you can see this person in 1985 had antibodies that were quite good at blocking infection by the virus from 1984. But as you look into the future from 1984, so as the virus evolves forward in time, you can see that the evolution of the virus is eroding that antibody neutralization. So this shows that coronavirus 229E is evolving to escape antibody immunity, similar to what you would see for influenza virus and different from what you would see for measles virus. The second point that I just want to make is we've done similar experiments for lots of different human serum. And so these are serum from isolated from different individuals, sort of old serum isolated from different individuals. And each of these people is probably making different antibodies that bind differently to the coronavirus 229E spike. And you can see as all cases, as the virus evolves, that evolution is eroding the neutralization by these antibodies, but the rate is very different. This person's antibodies are escaped very quickly. This person, it kind of takes some time, but they get escaped reasonably quickly. And this person is making antibodies that even decades later can neutralize the descendants of this virus from 1984 reasonably well. And so this just shows that different humans can naturally make antibodies that are more or less susceptible to being eroded by antibody or by viral evolution. And so one of the things that we're doing in our group right now is trying to understand the differences in these specificities. Because if you were to make a coronavirus vaccine, ideally would elicit evolution resistant antibodies like those shown on the right here, not evolution sensitive ones like those shown on the left. I next wanna talk about where we see most of the evolution occurring. So I'm gonna be talking about the spike protein in this talk because spike is the protein that's on the surface of a coronavirus and it's where the antibodies bind. So the spike is broadly broken into two parts called S1 and S2. And then within S1, there's an N-terminal domain and a receptor binding domain. So here I'm showing the spike of coronavirus 229E. There's the schematic on top. And here is a plot showing the sites where there have been a lot of mutations over the last four decades of coronavirus 229E evolution. And importantly, that's not just where mutations occurred, it's where evolution selected for those mutations so they spread in the viral population. And so you can see that evolution is strongly selecting for mutations in the S1 domain, particularly in the receptor binding domain, and then to a lesser degree in the N-terminal domain. If we now look at SARS-CoV-2, and we ask where have mutations occurred in the spike over just like the last three or four years of evolution by comparing an older viral isolate to a more recent one, we can see that SARS-CoV-2 is predominantly acquiring mutations in the receptor binding domain and to some extent in the N-terminal domain. And so this pattern down here looks quite similar to this pattern up here. So already over just three to four years of evolution, 
SARS-CoV-2 is settling into the same patterns that have been observed for other human coronaviruses. And the reason that we think that evolution is selecting for mutations in the receptor binding domain is that's the primary part of the spike where the neutralizing antibodies that block viral infection bind. And so, you know, I'm not going to show you all the data supporting this contention, but I promise you there's a lot of data behind it. Basically, pressure to escape from human antibodies is one of the main things driving the evolution of the virus. And the best mutations that help the virus do that are often in the receptor binding domain. And importantly, we do not anticipate that this process is going to stop anytime soon. It will probably never stop as long as there's a large population of humans to support the virus's evolution. So for instance, if you look at the coronavirus 229E receptor binding domain, or RBD, 25 of the 31 residues in this receptor binding domain that bind onto the receptor have changed over the last 50 years. So it shows that this but, but the protein still binds to the receptor. And so it shows that coronavirus 229E has a property that we're also now observing in SARS-CoV-2, and that there's a lot of plasticity in this spike, such that the virus can change the specific amino acid residues in the region that it uses to bind to the receptor in order to get away from antibodies, but yet continue to bind to that receptor. So I now wanna take a quick step back and talk about some of the broader patterns in this evolution and how they relate to uh, vaccines. So I already showed you the real phylogenetic tree for coronavirus 229E, and here's a schematized one. And I wanna emphasize again that it has this ladder-like shape. There's a major trunk lineage, and then lots of little variants on short branches that die out. This means that new variants displace old ones, and new variants descend from recent successful ones. This is also the pattern that's observed for human influenza A virus. And when a virus evolves this way, one theoretical vaccine strategy is that every year you pick a new vaccine, which is kind of trying to predict where the trunk of this evolutionary tree will go. And the reason that's a viable vaccine strategy, at least in principle, is because the genetic diversity of this virus is low at any given time. So if you guess the right thing, you can have a vaccine that's pretty well matched to all the viruses out there. You know, obviously there's no guarantee that you guess the right thing to put in the vaccine, but if you make that guess correctly, you'll probably have a good match with your vaccine. Uh, coronavirus OC43, which is another human coronavirus, split a number of decades ago into two lineages, each of which has now been evolving in a ladder-like fashion. This is also how human influenza B virus evolves, or at least evolved until very recently. Uh, and when a virus evolves this way, it's possible to do what was done for influenza B, which is try to pick a vaccine that matches each arm of this ladder-like evolution, so a bivalent vaccine. And finally, uh, you can also have viruses, for instance, like HIV, where there's both a lot of change over time and high standing genetic diversity. Uh, and basically if a virus is evolving in that fashion, it's going to be extremely difficult to make a vaccine because the vaccine is simultaneously gonna to have to cover a very wide range of viral diversity. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, although HIV is like this, you know, most human respiratory viruses are not. So what about SARS-CoV-2? So here is the next strain uh, sort of view of SARS-CoV-2 evolution. So first, I'm just going to go down here and show this, this frequency plot of different clades. So what this is showing is at any given time, what fraction of all of the SARS-CoV-2 out there was some particular variant, like alpha or delta or whatnot. So early on, we had uh, some SARS-CoV-2 variants uh, that most people don't know the names of. Uh, there's the A lineage and the B lineage, and there's D614G, which is called 20A. Uh, and, and we sort of had those variants out there. Those are all the ones in gray. Uh, then in late 2020, the first variant that most people have heard of called alpha started to spread. And alpha was spreading very rapidly. You can see the amount of alpha is increasing rapidly because it was highly transmissible. But before alpha could spread to be everywhere, uh, we had another variant called delta emerge. And Delta was extremely successful. And we got to a point in time where almost all of the SARS-CoV-2 out there in the world was Delta. But before Delta could fully take over, 
we got a new variant called Omicron BA1. And Omicron BA1 spread rapidly and almost everything was Omicron BA1. Then that was replaced by Omicron BA2. Then we had BA5. And then more recently, we've had these XBB variants. And now we have something called JN1 uh, that's taking off. So we see this same pattern of when a new variant comes up, it pushes out the old variants, outcompetes it, and spreads very rapidly. Another unusual feature of the SARS-CoV-2 tree is we see very long branches sometimes. So the best example of that is the emergence of Omicron BA1. BA1 is shown here uh, in, in these sort of green dots here. And you can ask, all right, what's the most recent ancestor of BA1 that was sampled? And it turns out you have to trace way, 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 way back here on the phylogenetic tree all the way to here to find kind of an ancestor-like virus to BA1. So BA1, Omicron BA1, emerged on a very long branch. It sort of had like 30 mutations in its spike all at once, and nobody saw them coming until the whole thing was spreading. And so this really raises a conundrum, which is how did Omicron acquire so many mutations with no sampled evolutionary intermediates? Because one of the things that you'll probably remember is it something that scientists are still doing, and particularly we're doing uh, you know, in 2021 when BA1 emerged, was sequencing a lot of SARS-CoV-2. You know, and all you had to do was like turn around and pick up a newspaper to read someone talking about how it's important to have more genomic surveillance so we understand how SARS-CoV-2 is evolving. Yet we did have quite a bit of genomic surveillance. So how did we manage to have all of that surveillance, be sequencing millions of viruses, and still totally miss the emergence of Omicron until it was basically upon us. So we can understand the process by which Omicron evolved by using a principle called the molecular clock. So the molecular clock is this idea that was formulated originally by uh, Emil Zuckercandle and the famous chemist Linus Pauling at Caltech in the 60s. And it's basically the idea that if you look at evolution, of any gene or genome or virus or whatnot, the number of mutations that it's acquired should be about proportional to how long it's been evolving. So mutations accumulate in a roughly clock-like fashion. So here's showing the total number of mutations in all of the SARS-CoV-2 clades up until the emergence of Omicron. And you can see they're all pretty much following this molecular clock line. And then here comes Omicron. And so you can see that Omicron is a little bit above this line. So it sort of looks like Omicron has more mutations than you'd expect for a virus of its age. So you can then ask sort of how did Omicron get these extra mutations? And to understand that, we can stratify what I'm showing here, which is all of the nucleotide mutations into different types of mutations. So first, I'm just going to show synonymous mutations. So these are mutations that do not change the protein sequence. And when we look at synonymous mutations, the, the numbers are smaller, so there's kind of more spread. Uh, but Omicron is about on the line, right? It doesn't really have, obviously, more mutations than would be expected given its age. We can also look at all of the amino acid mutations and all of the proteins that are not spike. So most of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins in Omicron fall right on this molecular clock line. So almost all of Omicron is evolving just like you'd expect, getting about the expected number of mutations. But if you look specifically for spike amino acid mutations in Omicron, you see that it has about twice as many mutations as you'd expect for a virus of its age. So somehow the process that led to the emergence of Omicron was strongly selectively favoring an excess of amino acid mutations in spike. And in fact, we now understand uh, exactly what process gives rise to that. Uh, in particular, excess antibody escape mutations in spike, as is seen in Omicron, are a characteristic of viruses that evolve in chronic human infections. And this has now been observed many, many times over. And so what do I mean by that? So typically, a virus like SARS-CoV-2 causes short self-limiting infections, right? Typically you get sick. If you're gonna transmit the virus, you transmit it certainly within the first week and then you get better and that's the end of it. Uh, and when, when the virus is evolving that way, there's a lot of transmission bottlenecks because this individual gets sick, 
And maybe some mutant viruses evolve within this person. Maybe some of them are beneficial for the virus and escape antibodies. But there's only a limited window before this person will clear this infection where they transmit to someone else. And this transmission typically involves these very narrow transmission bottlenecks, which often lead to the loss of any beneficial mutations that have, for the virus that have arisen in this first person. However, much less commonly, but still you know, quite a few absolute numbers of times across the whole world, SARS-CoV-2 can cause chronic infections where the same individual is infected for hundreds of days. This is typically happens with immunosuppressed or partially immunocompromised individuals who can't clear the infection. And in these chronic infections, because the infection is continuing in the same person for so long, a beneficial antibody escape mutation can arise in that person's infection and then it has time to totally sweep to fixation. And the same thing can happen again and again and again. And this can lead to very efficient selection for antibody escape mutations. And it's now been empirically observed these chronic infections can give rise to these highly mutated viral variants. And that's been observed again and again. So almost certainly what happened with Omicron, and then actually again with this BA2.86 variant, which is the parent, parent of the SARS-CoV-2 variant that's widespread right now, is that there was a virus that got into an individual, caused a chronic infection, accumulated a whole bunch of spike mutations, and then transmitted back to the general population. Okay, so, so far what I've talked to you uh, today about is basically can be boiled down to the fact that the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 is being driven by pressure for escape from human immunity in particular, escape from neutralizing antibodies. So what I want to talk about next is given that principle, can we try to understand sort of what might be next in the virus's evolution? And so I'm going to talk about the experimental approach that our group is trying to do that. We're trying to sort of understand the effects of mutations ahead of time so we can understand how the virus is going to evolve. So I'm first going to kind of jump into exactly how we do this. So to take a step back, all viruses have one or more entry proteins, which are what get them into cells, because all viruses have to get into a cell. So for SARS-CoV-2, this entry protein is spike. For influenza, it's called hemagglutinin. For HIV, it's called envelope. For loss virus, it's called glycoprotein. And something like Nipah virus or RSV actually has two proteins that do this job. They're called G and F. Mm. And so here, for instance, is SARS-CoV-2. You have this spike protein, and what it does is it binds to the receptor and then gets the virus into the cell. And pretty much all uh, antiviral vaccines, certainly all antiviral vaccines against respiratory viruses, work by eliciting what are called neutralizing antibodies. So neutralizing antibodies that bind to that entry protein and block infection. That's the primary mechanism of, of protection. And so one common way of studying these entry proteins is called pseudotyping. And, and to take a step back, we're using this method because we want to be able to rapidly and safely measure the effects of mutations of these viral entry proteins. And so when we set out to do this, we wanted a method that we could use to characterize the effects of mutations for many viral entry proteins. We wanted this method to be comprehensive. We could look at mutations throughout the protein. We want it to be high throughput. We can easily apply it to new variants and antibodies. We want it to be safe because if we're taking these viral entry proteins and making mutants of them, we don't want to generate novel, potentially dangerous viruses. So we wanted to come up with a safe way to do this. And then we wanted to be able to specifically study how mutations affect neutralization by human sera to capture heterogeneity between different people's sera. So something that can accomplish most of these goals is this technique of lentiviral pseudotyping, which probably at least some of you have used in your uh, experiments. And lentiviral pseudotyping is amenable to many different viruses, and it's a safe way to study their entry proteins. And basically, it works like this. You take the genome of a lentivirus, which is HIV, and you remove all of the viral proteins, and you just put in something like GFP or some reporter. You then transfect cells with plasmids that encode the proteins necessary to form the virion, 
along with an entry protein, which in this case is spike. And then you get out these viruses that have your reporter gene packaged in their genome, and they have your entry protein, in this case, spike on their surface, and they can infect cells and integrate into those cells and let's say turn them green if they're expressing a green protein. But because the viral proteins themselves are not encoded on the genome, they can't do anything more. It's a single cycle infection. So it's a very general approach. You can put in a lot of viral entry proteins and it's a very safe approach because the viruses you create can only undergo one cycle of infection. The limitation, if you wanna study the effects of lots of mutations, is that there's no so-called genotype phenotype link. There's nothing in your lentiviral genome which tells you what protein is on the outside of that. And so that's what we wanted to create. So to make a genotype phenotype link, what we simply did is take the lentiviral genome and we put one viral protein, just one viral, one of the many viral proteins you need to produce these virions back in the genome, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 spike. Then we put a little 16 nucleotide barcode downstream of that spike which we can then link to the spike sequence by PAC biosequencing. So we now have these barcoded lentiviral genomes, each of which is encoding a different spike mutant. We have this little barcode that tells us which spike mutant it has. And then for those of you who are real aficionados, uh, we also repaired the three prime LTR. But if you don't know the significance of that, I'm not gonna try to go into it here. Uh, then what we do is this two-step process where we transfect cells to initially just make standard lentiviral pseudoviruses, we then reinfect them into cells so they integrate their genomes and then select for the transduced cells such that each of these cells is now storing just one of these lentiviral genomes that encodes the spike. And then when we transfect back in these helper plasmids, we can get out a library of spike pseudotyped lentiviral particles. And we could then take these particles and do experiments on the whole pool of SARS-CoV-2 spike mutants all at once. So this is the second key thing. How do we do these experiments? What we do is we take our library of SARS-CoV-2 spike pseudoviruses and we incubate them with different concentrations of antibody. And depending on how well the antibody can neutralize these different viruses, that say the blue antibody is going to be neutralized when you start adding more antibody, but that say the red virus is going to be resistant and won't be neutralized by the antibodies because it has an escape mutation. And to sort of convert that into an absolute scale, we also add what we call a neutralization standard, which is a virus which is not neutralized. And then we simply compare the sequencing counts to that neutralization standard and can determine how well each virus is neutralized in each antibody concentration. So doing that, we get this huge wealth of information. So first, here's just doing this for one particular monoclonal antibody called LYCOV-1404. This was an antibody that was approved, uh, given emergency use authorization by the FDA, uh, and worked for a while until it was eventually escaped uh, in, in more recent SARS-CoV-2 variants. And so what we've done is, if, if I show you here, what we've done is at every position in this, we've measured how all of the mutations that are tolerated for spike entry, so that you can still have a functional spike if you have those mutations, how they affect neutralization by this antibody. So through most of the spike, mutations have no effect. There's a few sites where mutations have a big effect. <laughs> so if we sort of zoom in there, we can see that the mutations that really escape this antibody are at sites like 444, 445, 446, and also a little bit down here around site 499. And we can use this to understand why this antibody was escaped when it was. It was basically escaped when these XBB variants emerged that had mutations at sites 455 and 446. We can, and, and these sorts of high throughput measurements validate really well. So here we just took uh, four specific mutations made them and tested them in sort of the traditional way you do these experiments, one mutant at a time. And you can see the values we get out there correlate very well with this high throughput assay. And we can also apply this method to antibodies that bind to other regions of the spike, not the receptor binding domain. So here's an antibody that binds down in the S2 region. Uh, it's a region that's much more conserved during the evolution of this virus. 
and and these are antibodies that some people are thinking of developing as therapeutics, and we can sort of see that they're, uh, you know, which mutations escape them. And so sort of one uh, interesting thing for us has been uh, with doing these experiments is when we first started working in this area and trying to do experiments on, on RBD antibodies like ly cov 1404 our lab itself is not a lab that isolates these antibodies. We sort of do these escape experiments. And we were trying to get antibodies from other labs to test out these methods on. And sort of our collaborators would give us their antibodies that were okay, but not their very best antibodies. And the reason is they were trying to develop their best antibodies as SARS-CoV-2 drugs, like the J James Crow's lab that we were collaborating with, you know, developed the antibodies that went in AstraZeneca's SARS-CoV-2 cocktail. And part of the uh, approval process for an antibody like that is something called resistance analysis, where the FDA, at least in the U.S., requires you to sort of make some effort to identify what are the mutations that could escape your antibody and then you kind of have to explain to the FDA how you're going to monitor for and mitigate the effects of those mutations. However, the FDA does not really specify how exactly you have to try to find those resistance mutations. So initially, people actually did not want to give us the antibodies that they were going to try to develop uh, in the clinic because they knew that we were this method was going to be really good at identifying resistance mutations, which was just going to kind of create a regulatory headache. So they gave us the antibodies that they were kind of they're not quite as good ones that they weren't going to develop in that way. But what's been interesting working in this field is now this has totally changed because basically what happened is large amounts of money were spent developing a number of different SARS-CoV-2 antibodies into drugs that got FDA emergency use, use authorization. And now none of those antibodies that were developed in 2020 and the first part of 2021 work anymore. They've all been escaped by SARS-CoV-2 evolution. And I think now people really recognize that this escape is a real problem and that you're better off trying to identify these escape mutations early on, early in the antibody selection process and dealing with it because it's a real problem rather than just trying to avoid thinking about it until you get your antibody approved. Okay, so the real thing that we're interested in our lab, uh, in addition to sort of uh, this antibody escape, is understanding uh, how well can we predict the evolution of this virus? And so, as you know, uh, sort of the fitness of anything out there in the real world, including a virus, sort of depends on how well it can perform various tasks that it needs to perform. So fitness sort of depends on molecular phenotypes. And we certainly don't understand all of the molecular phenotypes uh, that shape the fitness of SARS-CoV-2 variants, but there are three key molecular phenotypes of the spike that we think are important contributors to the success of a virus. One of those is cell entry, which we can try to measure in the lab is how well one of these pseudoviruses can enter cells expressing ACE2. Another one is sera escape, which we can try to measure is how well do these pseudoviruses escape neutralization by human polyclonal antibodies. And a third one is ACE2 binding, which we can try to measure by how well does a pseudovirus bind to ACE2. And we can actually measure that uh, as sort of the inverse of how well the pseudovirus is neutralized by soluble ACE2. That's what this image down here is shown. And so the question we wanted to ask is, given that we can now use these high throughput approaches to measure these three molecular phenotypes for essentially all mutations, how well can we predict what actually goes on out there in the real world of SARS-CoV-2 evolution? Uh, and so first, I'm just going to show you these, these measurements we've made, where here what I'm showing you is for serum, for human serum, we can identify the specific sites where mutations escape that serum. So these are measurements for eight different human sera, and you can see sites like 473, uh, 456, uh, et cetera, are sites where mutations escape neutralization by these human sera. And then we can also go down and we can measure for any given mutation, uh, how much does that mutation affect the ACE2 affinity, shown here, or the cell entry of that mutation? So this is just showing like what one of these big data sets look like. This is like data on the effects of a whole bunch of mutations. So what we do to see if that corresponds to the real world is as follows. So here I'm showing all of the SARS-CoV-2 clades that are descended from XBB. 
So it's sort of a, a grouping of SARS-CoV-2 that was dominant in 2023. And for each of these different lineages, people can estimate the fitness of the variant based on how rapidly is that variant spreading in the human population. And, and that's how these things are colored. So variants that you may have heard of, if you follow SARS-CoV-2 evolution, uh, like XBB.1.5, and then EG.5.1, and then HB.1, th those are colored sort of more purple because they were the higher fitness variants. And there are some other lower fitness variants. And so if you look across the tree, uh, you can see each variant has some new mutations. And some of these variants are associated with higher fitness, right? The, the branches that are colored, uh, the more purple color, are branches that led to variants that have high fitness. So what we can just do is we can say, we're going to compare the change in fitness, which is the change in the growth of these viruses in humans, uh, between each pair of clades to our measurements of the effects of the spike mutations in that clade. And so here is just if we do a correlation, what is the change in growth rate from that new clade compared to its parents versus what we measure in the lab for the effects of those mutations that, that it has, just adding it up when there's multiple mutations. And so you can see, uh, you might expect that the variants that have more serum antibody escape would do better. There's a positive correlation. You might expect that the variants that are better at binding at ACE2 would do better, and there's a positive correlation. And you might expect that the variants that are better at cell entry would do better, and there's a positive correlation. None of these correlations are amazing, but some of that can be understood if you kind of look at specific points. So here, for instance, is the XBB.1.22.1 clade. It has a ton of serum antibody escape mutations, but yet, it didn't have very good clade growth, right? It's over here on the left in terms of clade growth. But that sort of makes sense because when you go over here and you look at its ACE2 binding, you can see it has mutations that are really bad for ACE2 binding. And you, you know you expect these traits to trade off. This virus might be good at escape, but not as good at entering cells uh, or binding to receptors. So what we can then do is we can take these three measurements and we can just do a multiple linear regression of the change in growth versus these three molecular phenotypes. And when we do that, we see that we can actually explain uh, an appreciable amount of the variance in the clay growth rates of, of sort of these strains out there in the real world, just from these experimental measurements we're making. You know, our predictions are not perfect. They're in fact a long ways from perfect. And I can identify three factors that make them not entirely perfect. One is that there's noise in our experiments. Uh, two is that we're only looking at the effect of spike mutations and mutations in other parts of the viral genome have some effect on fitness as well that we're just ignoring right now. And then the third one is that the experiments we're doing are measuring experimental proxies for what's really important about spike and probably, you know, in vitro neutralization and ACE2 binding affinity and cell entry into 293 ACE2 cells. They're correlated with what matters in the real world, but they're not everything that matters in the real world. Nonetheless, I think that this is kind of remarkable that we can now do these high throughput experiments in the lab, measure the effects of all mutations, and get data which has a reasonable amount of power to predict which different viral clades actually will have higher fitness for transmission in the human population. Okay, so to sort of conclude, uh, I first told you how some viruses evolved to escape antibodies. And unfortunately, coronaviruses uh, in general, and SARS-CoV-2 specifically, are among those viruses. I told you how the patterns of evolutionary substitution we see in the SARS-CoV-2 spike are similar to those that have been observed in other human coronaviruses. I talked about how we can use experiments, deep mutational scanning experiments, to identify the mutations that cause escape from human antibodies uh, and, and also affect other molecular phenotypes. And finally, I told you how these data that we can measure in the lab can be used to forecast with not perfect, but actually reasonable accuracy, sort of the relative clay growth of actual human SARS-CoV-2 clades. Uh, finally, I'd like to end with some thanks. Uh, the pseudovirus deep mutational scanning that I discussed was done primarily with by Bernadetta in my group, and Kate and Kalen also helped set up the system.
Uh, prior to using that pseudovirus deep mutational scanning, uh, Tyler Starr, who was a postdoc in our group but is now a professor at Utah, and Ali Greeny uh, were using a yeast display system, which also generated a lot of useful data. And then Rachel did the work on coronavirus 229E. And I'd like to thank a lot of collaborators, uh, particularly for the work I was describing here, uh, Helen Chu, David Wiesler, and Ben Morell. Uh, and again, the link to the slides I presented is here. And I'm happy to take questions if anybody just feels like unmuting themselves and asking a question. All right, thank you.